Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. Now, if you watched our last LARP video, you may know that Maddie and I took a way more active role. Specifically, we made a whole bunch of like challenges and quests for other players to go on. Which I'm not gonna lie, was a lot of work, but it was so much fun to do that I really want to do some more. So I thought it'd be really cool to kind of workshop and make some sort of a, a prop that could become part of a quest. So here's what I'm envisioning, right? The players, they find something that has like a coded message on it. And there are these little pieces out in the world that once put together, act as like a little decoder ring to decode that message. We'll workshop how it's done. It makes sense in my dome piece. So let's just, let's just go right into it and level up this skill. Okay, so the thought here is, is making some sort of an ancient artifact of sorts that can like decode somehow. Now my first thought here is to cast this thing out of metal, but if you know my history with casting so far, see this episode here, you'll know that it isn't, hasn't been good. It's one of the few skills that have, have beat me so far and it hurts my soul. And I was determined to try to make this work today. Notice, this is ominous foreshadowing. But the first thing I need to do to get that done is to make a mold of some sort. But to make the mold, I first need to actually make the thing, like make a template of the thing that I can then cast into that mold. Now you can make this out of anything you want. You can do it out of clay, which would probably be the easiest way to do it. But in that first episode where I tried to cast metal, I had made something with my 3D printer and I really want to make that work. Luckily with today's sponsor, Anchor Make, I have a second chance at redemption. They sent me a shiny new Anchor Make M. 5 3d printer to test out now i was a little on the fence with this because the last few projects i had anything to do with a 3d printer was such a pain for me from like leveling the plate to actually printing the thing i always had some kind of failure that happened but this thing out of the box was so much easier first and foremost it was like 90 percent already put together the only things i actually had to put together were the top extruder assembly to the bottom plate that entire setup took maybe 15 minutes and a good portion of that was me just like reading through the directions on how to put it together. The app and being able to read everything right off the screen that's happening with the printer is huge, especially because it has a built-in camera so I can actually physically see what's happening as it goes. Also, can I just say the fact that this thing like self-levels is so mint. That was the hardest process for me to master with my other thing. And the fact that this does it just all by itself is just, it's so good. And this sucker is super fast. I guess they upgraded the speed to 500 millimeters per second, which is like crazy quick. With that type of speed, I've been printing nonstop, not only just useful stuff, but like fun toys for myself and everything. <laughs> I really do like this machine. Now I didn't have to use it, but apparently it also has a built-in error detection. So if it doesn't stick to the mat or if it starts to like spaghetti mess, it'll actually let me know so I can stop the progress and not have a bunch of wasted filament. And this little test project is probably the fastest, most intricate print I've ever made. And I totally get why they use that model as the test. Look at what a flex this thing is. Like it has hardly stopped working since I got it. I have like 50 pieces here for my camera that I now don't have to buy. But in all of these, I haven't had a single failure. The thing has been mint. So yeah, from the setups to all the prints, like 100%, I stand by this product. So if you're interested in it, or if you're in the market for a 3D printer, I highly recommend this one. Check out the link in the description below. All right, so to design this thing, I actually went into Blender so I can make these flat disks that would work. Now, if you've never used 3D software before, you can check out this episode here where I go over some of the basics. Once I had the general shape I wanted, I went online and looked for some fonts that I thought would be cool in this project. I ended up going with a runic font that I thought would be cool for like the coded message. And then of course I added on the regular alphabet as well. Both of which I randomized just to make it a little bit more fun. So it didn't go in the order of like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like it was all over the place. So that when you're decoding it, you're really gonna have to search. I want it to be a fun kind of mission. I also found a 3D print file on Thingiverse that was a Viking brooch kind of thing. That I just stuck right on top of the little disc here to make it decorative. Finally, I added this decorative border all around the edge of my disc. I know there's a cursory overview. I mean, if I was to teach you Blender, that would be a whole thing by itself, and that's probably not why most of you are here. But I'll leave links on the YouTube channel that I use to learn this program in the description below. Anyways, once I was happy with those files, I just brought them over to the slicer that comes with the Anchor Make and got this bad boy to printing. And again, this printer is super slick. It went to work and got this thing done in no time. 
Now it's hard to make out because cameras don't really dig the color white, but all of the details are super perfect on this thing. All the lettering and the scroll work on the top part, it just, it looks so good. And honestly, if you didn't care about like the weight or the feel of the thing, you just kind of wanted a general look, you could probably paint this up as is and make a pretty cool prop. But I want this thing to be like weighty. I want it to feel like it's like an ancient thing. So to make that happen, we're now gonna cast this thing into some silicone. This way we can use the wax mold that we can try to use to make the metal parts. So the first thing I did was cut these pieces of wood so I can build a little frame around them. Once they were in position, I used a clamp to hold them tight and then reinforce those edges with a little bit of duct tape. We want to be able to take this mold apart once we're done so we don't need it really secure. Then to add a bottom, I just placed it on another piece of plywood. Now, though we want to be able to take this thing apart so it doesn't need to be like all screwed together, we don't want any of the product, like the silicone we're going to pour into this thing, to seep out. So we're going to need to seal up the edges. To do this, I just added a bead of hot glue all along the joints. I also added some where the walls meet the floor just to make sure there's no way for any of the silicone to seep out. I've had is issues in the past with silicone seeking out. It is not fun. Finally, I added a little bit of hot glue to the bottom of my 3D prints just so they won't move around. Remember, a 3D print is mostly full of air, so I was afraid it was going to kind of float to the surface if I wasn't careful. All right, so the silicone I'm going to be using for this is a two-part product named Dragon Skin. I've used this in the past while making dice, which you can see in this episode right here. I love this stuff though, because it has a really short pot time and cures very, very fast. And let me tell you what, I'm always running these episodes right on the wire, so I don't have time, I don't have time to wait ever. And these are super simple to use because they're equal parts. So I just poured the whole leftover contents of these canisters into a mixing bucket. Then I made sure they were thoroughly stirred together. And now fair viewer, let me, let me give you a second, let me get you behind the curtain here because this was a carnival of errors for me this whole project starting with with this bit so I used what was left over of that dragon skin product because I had made other projects before with it and I didn't want to go out and buy more not only did I not want to spend the money because I'm cheap and I don't have it but also the place that I can physically drive to to get it closed down recently which kills me inside so i had to order it i didn't realize this the day i was doing this i was calling them being like hey do you mind if i swing by and pick up some more of this stuff and they're like oh our location is closed you can come to new york for it no <laughs> no but i rolled the dice to see if this would work but once i started pouring it into that mold i realized that it was gonna like just miss covering everything i was freaking heartbroken so to get around this, I started adding all these little pieces of wood to take up some of that volume so that my little bit of dragon skin went a lot a bit further. Luckily, this actually worked. By doing that, just kind of ramming wood all around the sides, it took up that extra space and made it so that I had about like a half of an inch over my, my molds, which was just great. But yeah, you know, measure twice, cut once, you know what I mean? Plan ahead of time. Once this was all set, I went ahead and banged on my table a little bit just to get all the little air bubbles to surface. This is gonna make sure there's no air bubbles clinging to the piece in there itself, leaving me with voids later on. And after about an hour, I felt safe taking this thing apart. Silicone's great, it sticks to itself, but it doesn't stick to a lot of other things, so this thing came apart really easily. Not only that, but my 3D printed pieces slid right out and the detail was perfect. Every little nook and cranny looks so good. Even all the lines the 3D printer leaves was perfectly preserved into this silicone. Now, because I've done a lot of like waterproofing projects with wax, I have just, just a stupid amount of paraffin wax. Beeswax too, but for this one, I decided to use some paraffin. I just poured that melted wax right into my silicone mold here. Then after waiting for about an hour for everything to cool down, I demolded it to find out it was absolutely perfect. In fact, I ended up casting another one of them, which should be a more foreshadowing that things don't go as planned. But they're so cool. I want to turn them into little like candles or something. They're so perfect looking. Look at my little, my little wax puzzle thing. This thing is so cool. <laughs> Sorry, it's the little things. Now, in order to take something from wax and turn it into metal, we use something called green sand or foundry sand. 
This stuff is super fine and kind of wet and does a really good job taking on the shape of whatever you push into it. So to try to get this into that sand, I put them onto a metal plate to give me a nice flat surface and put that wooden box that I made earlier around it. Then using a strainer, I push the foundry sand through just to make sure it's nice and fine and can get into all those details. Once I had it filled up, I used the end of a piece of wood just to push the sand in. Not too hard, but enough so that I was sure that it was surrounding the whole piece. Then I used the board just to make sure the bottom of the piece was nice and flat. With that all good, I flipped it over to show that everything was super solid and ready to go. Now the thought here is, is we can pour the molten metal into the wax, which will then burn away immediately, and then the metal will take the place of the wax, leaving us with the exact shape that the wax used to be in. That's the theory. We're gonna see how this works out. <laughs> And this is where my second little ride of my carnival of errors come up. In the past, in order to melt pieces of metal, I've had a little crucible. These things are specifically designed to take the kinds of heats you need in order to melt metal. And for the life of me, I could not find mine. I still can't find mine. I searched for an entire day, tore this whole place apart. I have no idea what happened to it. I will bet you my kingdom at some point I threw it away like a jerk. Didn't mean to, it was in with something else. I guarantee it, so dumb. Anyways, I had to think on the fly because the whole project was resting on this actually working out. So to make a makeshift foundry, I emptied out this old fire extinguisher that was past its prime. Then I used my angle grinder and cut the top off. This isn't me just winging it. I mean, it's me winging it for sure, but I looked online to see what like a good replacement for a foundry would be. And this was what was recommended. So I'm going with it. Now the metal I'm going to be melting for this, the metal I have is this aluminum here. These are actually gifted to me by friend of the channel, Eric E. Thank you for them. And also I'm, I'm very sorry for what I do with them. Very sorry. And to melt these, I'm using the Inferno 9000 that I made in this episode right here. To which I just added some already fiery coals and securely nestled in my makeshift crucible. Adding in some extra coal just to make sure it was snug and ready to go. Then I popped in them metal muffins for melting. Magical. And other M words. You get it. Okay, prepare yourself for just, just some epic some epic failure. So the last time I did this and the last time I've seen it done, the wax, once the metal hits it, just friggin' burns away. It, it disappears. I don't know if paraffin wax is the wrong wax. I don't know if there's just too much of it in this mold. But as soon as my molten metal hit it, yes, it bursts into flames, but it just kind of skittered across the top. And then I couldn't see it because the angle I was at, the, the, the canister was actually like covering my, my line of sight. But the melted aluminum just kind of drifted along my driveway. And then continued to just ignite everything. It was an inferno. So what I think happened, what I'm envisioning happening is the same thing that if you have like a, a wet hand or whatever, or when people do fire walks. When you do that, there's a little barrier that's formed from the moisture actually like, like, gassing off because of those higher temperatures. What I think happened was as soon as the wax, because there was so much of it, started to melt, it wasn't bursting into flame fast enough. I don't think the aluminum was hot enough for that. So you end up with this layer of like gas and then a layer of moisture and it just wasn't melting away fast enough. Whatever it was, it was a stunning inferno that left me with just a whole bunch of melted asphalt in my driveway. There is still a line of just just discolored, pivoted in asphalt in my driveway. <laughs> in my driveway. <laughs> Not only that, but uh, so it turns out that that makeshift crucible was a was a one-time thing. It burnt straight on through. I could put my finger through it now. So metal casting's out for today, <laughs> kids. The metal casting's out. I am so sorry. I am hell bent on making this work. If you are like good at casting with metal, please berate me first. Like the first portion of your thing in the comment section should be talking about how dumb I am and how poorly I did that. I deserve it, it should come. But after that, please do tell me what I'm doing wrong cause hot damn I can't make this work. Anyways, <sighs> plan B. The vibe of what I'm going for is something old, something ancient. And sure, like having it in metal would have been cool with that weight, I think if I was to have it in stone somehow, that would work. That being said, I'm not gonna carve this thing into stone. That's not what we're doing here today. I already have a silicone mold that should work, so 
I'm going to use a product I've actually never used before. And that is this stuff called Ultra Cal 30 Gypsum Cement. From what I've read, unlike other plasters, this stuff will harden to almost be like stone, which is what I need because if we're using them in like a game setting, they might fall, they might get dropped. I don't want them to just shatter. So to use this stuff, you just have to mix it with water at a ratio of 38 parts water to 100 parts of the product. Which sounds a little complicated, but honestly, just like measure out 100 grams and then add in 38 grams of water. So for me, I end up using 300 grams of the product, which ends up being 114 grams of water. Then I just mixed together with an attachment for my drill to make sure it was nice and smooth. And then I went back in with a gloved hand to make sure I need the little crumbly pieces were all broken up. Now there is a warning on the package not to like cast your hand like you would with plaster if you wanted to make like a plaster cast of yourself. Because the alkalinity is so high, you can suffer burns. So definitely don't have this stuff just like on direct skin contact. And the consistency was a lot more watery than I was used to, almost like a little thinner than you'd want pancake mix to be. But the reason for this is this product is actually really good at getting a lot of detail. And with a thinner mix like that, it can get into all the little crevices and nooks and crannies. But to make sure that it got into all the details I wanted it to, I first added a little bit to the mold and then used my fingers to push it into place, just making sure it filled in all the cracks and details. Once I was happy with that, I filled in the rest of the mold with the slurry. Then of course did the same thing with the dome side. Once those were all full, I again pounded on the table just to make sure that I got out all of the air bubbles. Finally, I smoothed out around the edges to break the surface tension to make sure it laid down nice and flat. If you fill in that cavity exactly, the surface tension is actually gonna make it so it makes a bit of a bubble on the surface. You don't want that because it's not gonna sit flat. You want it to sit flat, so you gotta kinda pull it out a little bit. Now the super dope stuff about this, especially for me, is it's Ultra Cal 30. So in about 30 minutes, this thing was ready to demold, which was great because after all my failures, I was running real tight on time, real tight on time. But look at the detail here. Like once I popped it out of the mold, I was astounded by how great this looked. There's almost too much detail because again, all the little like 3D printer marks totally came on through. That's how crazy detailed this was. I loved how good this looked. Now, when you first demold this thing, it's still green, which means it's, it's kind of moist to the touch. If you were to put it like against you, it would feel cooler than the air around you. This is the perfect time to make any corrections you need to. So for all these little print marks and the clearly machined looking things, I was able to get rid of those really easily just using some sandpaper at this point. Because it is green and still relatively soft, it almost takes no effort to get rid of all those little blemishes. At this point too, I also use my drill just to make a hole in the middle. This way the two pieces can come together to fulfill their function. I then took the piece down to my workshop and carved in little cracks and imperfections while it was still in the softer state. This was kind of fun to do to think of like the years that it went through where it was just kind of buried and kicked around and maybe dropped a few times. Tiny little fissures and cracks that have come through the years. I want this to look like something that's ancient. I even use the edge of one of my knives just to chip away at the edge of it in certain places. Again, to make it look like maybe it was dropped or bumped against things that, that took little chips out of it. Of course, just making sure not to take away any of the writing. We obviously need for the alphabet to stay intact. And after 24 hours, this thing was rock hard. Nice. But seriously, it went together, it spun around, all the like alphabets matched up, which was really hard to do, by the way. When I was designing it, making sure like the A matched with the A ruin or whatever was a real pain. <laughs> But at this point, it looks like a plaster piece. Like it doesn't look like something old. Sure, it looks like it's made out of stone, kind of, but it's too perfect. To start aging this thing up and making it look a little bit more cool, I just busted out some of this basic acrylic paint here and a Ziploc bag. All I did was squirt some of that paint in the corner of the Ziploc bag here and then add in a decent amount of water. Once that was in there, I just went ahead and made sure that the paint was thoroughly mixed into the water. Basically, we just made a large black wash here that we could use to not only color that plaster, but add extra depth to those pieces that are like lower in. So to do this, I just took that top piece and popped it right in that bag and then sloshed it around for a couple of minutes. Once I took it out, not only was the plaster much darker, but all those little grooves and details really stuck out more. Like you can see when compared to the original piece, how much more depth and color this has. It looks way more like stone now. And of course, I just followed suit with the bottom piece doing the exact same thing. And once all the excess wash was wiped away, 
This thing actually really looked like stone. Those little cracks stuck out well. Everything looks so good. Now this thing is starting to look like an ancient artifact of some sort. Now to add a little bit more detail and life to this thing, I went ahead and poured out some white paint on a piece of cardboard. And then after dipping my brush in it, wiped almost all of it away. Doing this makes it so that I can dry brush some of that white on all of the raised pieces of it, which bring those way more to the surface and send those darker areas back. This just gives the whole thing a lot more volume and personality. It also added kind of this marbling effect that I really dig. That being said, I want this to look like it's part of a culture that maybe in the past is like really glorious. Just hints at a former glory, you know what I mean? So for that, I thought I'd add some like gold to it. Again, just adding some gold metal paint by dry brushing it onto all those raised areas. And this ends up being a really great technique for this. All of the ornate scroll work took on just a little bit of a golden shine, as did the raised letters and the filigree along the sides. Now it looks like there was a former glory to it, right? Like it, it was beautiful at one point, and then throughout years and years, it's been buried in the ground or something, and it's gotten more worn away. For one last thing, I really wanted to make this look like it was a lost artifact. So I wanted to add some like grime to it, maybe some, some moss. So to do that, I decided to use this battlefield step grass made by army painters. This is the stuff that people use when they make like small models like dioramas or maybe D&D kind of like staging. Just to make it look like there's grass or there's moss. And to apply it, I'm just going to use some plain old Elmer's glue. This I just painted onto the areas that I thought some moss would look good and then sprinkled some of that battlefield grass stuff right into place. After giving it a few minutes to cure, I went back in with a paintbrush and just brushed away all of the excess material. Doing this left me with a really nice old looking piece. And once together, look at how dope this thing looks. It looks like an ancient little artifact. Like, can you imagine you're on a quest of some sort and you find this piece somewhere and it looks like it's old and worn and made out of stone. And then later on, you find this piece and you realize the two pieces, they look similar and they go together. And from there, you can crack the code on the ancient document that has the secret to where the treasures lie or something. Oh, I love that. That is so cool. It's such a dope, like, Legends of the Hidden Temple little prop, and I love it. I think this would make a fun quest for somebody during a game. And even if you're not throwing a game, it's just kind of a cool looking little prop. Like, look at this thing. It's so dope. So, we had a lot of little failures today, but we rolled with it. I'm going to do an episode soon where I master casting. It is now, it is now a vendetta. <laughs> But I'm curious, what would you use this particular technique for? I think this came out great. Like what kind of props can you imagine making with this type of technique? Leave it in the comment section below. I'd love to see how you go about it. Real quick, I want to send a special thanks to all of the people who have been signing on to come to Conquest with us. If you don't know what we're talking about, check out this episode right here. But basically we're going to Germany for the largest LARP in the world, Conquest. And Berg Snyder, the people who run that particular LARP, has invited our community to come out. Basically, if we're able to get 20 people to come along with us, they're going to give us, like, our own little quests, a night at a tavern that's just for our group. There's going to be drinking and singing and just, like, a great time for us all. So, for those of you who've decided to come along with us, I am over the moon. I can't wait to hang out with you. Oh, and an extra special congratulations to Rachel M., who won our Level Up LARP competition. In the last level, everybody had to write some backstory about their character and how they actually get to Conquest. Rachel went ahead and made a whole, like, choose-your-own-adventure. It was really cool. That being said, all of the contestants did some amazing stuff. I'm so incredibly, like, impressed with everything you guys came up with. And though this competition is over, stay tuned, because we're doing a lot more work with Berg Snyder, and we've got some really great stuff up ahead. Finally, I told y'all I would pick one of you to send like some really nice pieces of scrap leather to. So today we're gonna pick that winner. So the winner is Kyle Weaver 9283. Congratulations on winning some scrap leather. But that's not all, because I've decided since I've made you wait a couple of weeks, I'm gonna pick two winners. So our second winner is Liz Campbell 7759. So the both of you do me a favor, go down in the description, find my contact information and hit me up on either email or Instagram and I will get that right to you. And I hope you share with us your mighty build. All right, well, I think that's all I've got going on today. I have to, I bought, I bought another crucible. We're getting this done. I promise you this. In the meantime though, 
Keep leveling up, you. You've made it to the end screen. YouTube loves it when you do that. It is a fantastic way to support this channel. Another fantastic way to support this channel is by joining these people's noble ranks. These are our Patreon members, and without them, this ship just does not sail. They make it so we can actually afford all of the stuff we do here and keep the lights on. I want to give a special shout out to our newest high tier Patreon level members, Michael Register, Ken Richards, and the Rangers Respite. Thank you so much for helping to support this channel. Honestly, it means just everything to us, so really thank you. If you like what we do here and want to support us, consider joining our Patreon, link in the description below. Otherwise, you can check out one of these here that YouTube thinks you'd like, and that helps us too. While you do that, I'm going to play with my little artifact here that was clearly made by Ancient Aliens, as all artifacts are. It's on the Discovery Channel. It has to be true.